Hello, everybody. Welcome. I am Aurora. This is March 29th, 2023, and this is Level 2, Lesson 14. It's all about longevity and energetic hygiene. So as I was just scrolling through my notes while everybody waited here patiently for me, I said, don't worry, because I'm getting to the point in the semester where I'm just going to diverge from my notes completely. I get I get that way almost every semester, and you'll find that if you watch through my archives, but probably not, not permanently. But this morning, as I was preparing for class, I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about because I always reassess are the things that I have written about from 10 years ago still relevant to right now, especially in light of the very extraordinary challenges that we are facing in terms of spiritual attainment and the spiritual attainment has everything to do with energetic hygiene. So although I have the notes prepared and I sent them out as part of the email welcome for all of this class, I think I wanna just speak extemporaneously about the things that work and the things that I currently do. Um, I also wanna say that, so I put these sharings out there on YouTube. And generally everything is safe for every member of the family. But today I'm going to refer to orgasm as an aspect of energy cir circulation through our body. So I just want to make that clear in case anybody has younger children or children that don't quite yet know what that is all about. That might be something for parents to in introduce your children to and maybe not from me and from this video. But this video is intended for everyone else. And the way that we're going to talk about this is of course, um, very re respectful and mature and really has nothing at all to do with um, the society's view on what sexuality is. That's, that's where I'm coming from with that because um, energy and energy as it flows through your chakras and the energy experience event that we know as orgasm has everything to do with energetic hygiene. And it's something that was not, that I did not share in my notes from 10 years ago, even though it was relevant then. Um, but I'm just was trying to think about how I can share this and preface this with you. So, you know, I always, I, I can bring up a picture of my, uh, my traditional chakra pictures here. Do I have something prepared for class? I had it, I had it up for a um, thing that I was doing last week. Hold on a second. I'll just bring up a generalized picture of the chakras so that we can talk about this. This is the one I usually use for us. Okay. Hold on. I'll just do a generalized share screen. Okay. So anything that when I'm talking about energetic hygiene, I wanted to define this here today by saying that that refers to anything that is light flowing through this system, which is your time body or your, your light body, your body of pure light and pure information. So just as we have hygiene for your physical body and hygiene for your physical body is something that is about daily, weekly, monthly maintenance for your lifespan of your body to be able to keep it like a healthy vehicle, keep your car on the road, right? Your non-physical body of pure energy also requires hygiene, some of which is daily, some of which is moment to moment, some of which is, you know, ongoing at all times, and some of which is, um, you know, eventful, but not every day, but happens occasionally and must be done. So, you know, whatever, like, if I used an example from, you know, physical reality, like, you might go to the dentist to get your teeth cleaned, once a year or every six months or whatever it is like it needs to happen on occasion but not every day but you brush your teeth for daily hygiene and and maintenance every day all right so let's talk about what is the purpose of energetic hygiene it is basically to realign your chakras these are your chakras or your energy centers to make sure that they are well calibrated nested within or nested and balanced upon each other effectively because each one of these is a spinning wheel of energy to keep it with positive momentum just like bicycle wheels to keep these energy wheels moving and to have them moving in conjunction with one another because for example your eye of insight rests directly upon your heart chakra and you need to have both of these aspects of your energetic anatomy well calibrated, moving at a, a, a proper speed and functional in order for the entirety of your being to work. So really when we talk about energetic hygiene, we're talking about the things that make everything work. And when it's not just a question of like, 
fixing or healing or rebalancing one chakra or energy center of your body, all of these things work and fit together. Just like really the holistic presence of your physical body. In your physical body, you know, your skin actually works together with your circulatory system and your, your respiratory system. Like these things are not discrete. So same thing with your physical, with your non-physical body of pure light. Um, all aspects of your light body or your non-physical body work together. They are not discrete, although they are layered and they might be moving at different rates through time. They all interact and they all interrelate. So let's start with the, the top one, the first one that I just mentioned, which is orgasm. And orgasm is very much related in the anatomy that it uses and the mechanics, for lack of a better word, or the... Um, chain reactions and the things that are happening in your body, very related to sun gazing. And I haven't emphasized this enough. So sun gazing, and first of all, sun gazing, I call it cosmic love making, but this is also something just like when I talk about Christ being non-denominational, sun gazing is a euphoria and a pleasure and a reconnection and a use and an alignment with creative life force energy that is not based in sexual partnership. And that's big because once we start to get into these feelings that happen in the pleasure centers of the body, then it is easy to project sexuality upon those experiences because that is what our world is based upon. But please don't misproject. You can have a spiritual experience that involves the activation of pleasant sensations in your pleasure centers that has nothing to do with the interpretation of sexuality or sexual gratification. But these two things are related. So let's start off with the first one, which is orgasm, whether it is on your own or whether it is with a partner, it is an essential aspect of energetic hygiene. And that this is, of course, information that is aimed at those who are already adult, mature people who have achieved maturity in their physicality. Body. This is not aimed at anyone that is still, you know, like going through the hormonal changes that are necessary in the body. So uh, when we talk about that, experience. It is literally a raising of what, what from the perspective of the embodied human, it is a raising of energy because you're starting at the red chakra base of the spine and then bringing that energy up to the top of the head. And then it feels like there's a reconnection here and a joyful or euphoric expansion that comes out the top of your head. But really from my perspective, ancient Atlantis and the way that energy is supposed to be, you're supposed to be constantly connected at, through you, the entire spectrum of who and what you are to that divine energy. And every movement is really meant to be a euphoric expansion, explosion of that type of energy. But again, from this perspective of where you are right now, it feels like starting at the bottom and climbing to the top because you have to make this type of reconnection. And then um, it's, it's an essential reconnection to make. So just I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm stumbling over myself here because I don't want to make it sound like you're not good enough because you're, you're um, starting from this disconnected way. That is the goal. Eventually, you will be constantly connected uh, at all levels of your chakras, from your root chakra and the energy that flows out through the bottoms of your feet and connects to the earth, all the way to your crown chakra and to everything that is connected to the sun and the stars and the faster moving, more ephemeral or less dense levels of reality. That's the goal, which is really the return. In the meantime, when I talk about energetic hygiene, what you wanna do is make this connection on a regular basis because it is everything about um, nourishing all of the uh, le levels of your being. And I also wanna say body parts because those experiences um, send energy throughout the circulatory system of your whole body. So what happens is energetic hygiene involves clearing away debris, just like if you have a water conduit, whatever, a river, a lake, a stream, or a creek, or garden hose, or something like that, you want water to flow through it effectively. You have to clear away any debris, rocks, sand, gravel, silt that might get in there. And then once you clear it away, then there is a, um, a channel or a connection for that water to flow. What we're talking about is life force energy, that you want to make certain that there is a clear pathway for the life force energy to flow. And it flows not only like in those figure eight patterns, but it flows up and down throughout your whole body. So if I just use this as my picture for being able to share today.
get a good color. The life force energy pictured here in white. So we're experiencing it as circulating upward from the pleasure centers that are the red orange chakras all the way up the spine, all the way up the spine. It feels like it's in a linear um, journey and it comes up to here and then it goes up out through the top of the head. That's, part, that's what it's doing because you're finally getting a reconnection in um, a circuit is the word that you should be dealing that circuit all the time. Um, but when you're making that circuit, what happens is also, um, you see how I have all of these figure eights? You end up getting a whole profusion of light that goes throughout your whole entire body in all of these figure eights. So that is an essential maneuver or activity to do in your life. And all of these things that I'm going to talk about that are about energetic hygiene have to do with creating those pathways. So clearing out pathways, cultivating life force energy, and then making the life force energy flow in proper patterns. This is what energetic hygiene is. And energetic hygiene also relates to longevity. And all of this relates to coherence. Coherence is light waves that stick together. I will use my customary joke. Light waves stick together like good waffles. It is what good waffles do. So you want your um, light waves of your body to be in unison all going at the same way, kind of like dolphins, how they all like jump together. And it is a very joyous experience. And it also relates to, so it has euphoria to it and also relates to what humans describe as bliss or a flow state. And flow state also relates to frictionlessness, clearing the debris from your conduits and um, clearing the debris from your activities in time and clearing the debris from your mind and your motivations so that you flow effortlessly from one event to another or from one time moment and activity to another. So there are different levels of energetic hygiene. Some of them have to do with the non-physicality presence of your you know, your, your light body that I just showed you. Some of them have to do with your physicality body, which of course is a layer of your being. So I'll talk about that. Into, that basically relates to yoga, exercises, and if, even different sleeping positions. And then some of energetic hygiene relates to your environment because you are not in a contextless void. You actually are in an environment and that includes other organisms, but also the objects that are in your space and I'm gonna talk about structuring water as an aspect of energetic hygiene and structuring your space. So basically for good energetic hygiene, this is exactly like physical body hygiene. Like first let's just, okay, and okay. And we'll get, to, I'll get to your question because we've already got questions and I'm happy for people to um, ask me about things. Let's talk just physical, regular hygiene. Like we were, we would teach, you know, like a, a young person just growing up, right? What are some of the things that you have to do? Like you have to do things that clean your body of basic metabolites. Like when you brush your teeth, it's because you're cleaning off like things that are the byproduct of, of eating, right? Or excreting, peeing and pooping. These are like cleaning out body metabolism type of stuff like that. Or how about like washing your face? You get a wash off effluvia. How about brushing your hair? Like you're brushing out dead, getting rid of dead skin cells, getting rid of stuff that's dead, all right? So that's what a lot of those things are. We need to do that energetically with the, with the non-physical body. And you need to do that in your space as well. You need to look at your physical space of where you live and your rooms that you occupy, your car, your office space, or wherever you do your work in your life as being the outside is always reflective of the inside. And I say this to people all the time, especially I've talked to people about this when they're in the process of moving or relocating. I say moving and relocating is not just an ordinary mundane task, like getting your U-Haul and packing it up and bringing your stuff to a new location. The outside reflects the inside. So um, packing up all of your stuff is indicative of making uh, a emotional life change and a timeline life change. Energetic hygiene and moving in a frictionless state of bliss has everything to do with being on the optimum timeline. And when you clean up your environment, like right now, I will admit to you and confess 
I didn't clean up my bedroom today. There's like some pajamas on the floor and like a couple of other things. And there's a, um, I had a midnight snack and there's a, a dish and, a, and um, you know, like a cup sitting there. Like there's a lot of stuff that you can trip over on the floor. It's not just like a nice clear over open expanse. And in order for me to have good energetic hygiene, what I need to do is clean up the floor. I don't need to put all those things in a hefty bag and throw them out. No, they're valuable things, but they need to be placed where they belong because they don't belong in the middle of the floor. So that relates in every single way as an analogy to what you're doing in your non-physical energy presence and in the organization of your life and of your emotions and of your um, activities from moment to moment. My cup is a very valuable cup that I like. I drank coconut milk out of it last night. I don't want to throw the cup away out the window. I want to put it in the sink, wash it up, put it in the cabinet where it belongs. Same thing with, let's say, a relationship. Let's say you talked to someone on the phone or had some interaction. It's a valuable interaction, but now you've got like an empty coffee cup. You've got emotional stuff that you have to process and clean up the metabolite of the conversation that you had with spouse, friend, coworker, or any person that you interacted with or anything that you saw or did on the internet. Valuable interaction, the coconut milk was very valuable to me, but, and now you've got a chore that you have to clean up. So after you eat stuff, you have to brush your teeth to clean up, right? After you use dishes, you have to do the dishes, put them in the washer or, you know, put them in the sink and wash them up. And after you have, interactions with other living creatures or life experiences, you have to metabolize and it's called emotional processing. And sometimes it's with a physical person. Like I talked with someone on the phone or I saw someone on the street and we talked about this and that, and then I had to process it emotionally. But sometimes you see something, even looking at a billboard, you can be like, wow, I just had an emotional experience. Now I have to process it because I saw a thing or I did a thing, all right? And none of this is meant to be burdensome or a strike against you in life. It's just the sense it can be feel overwhelming or burdensome if you have a backlog of stuff. Like if I never did the dishes and I had every single empty coffee cup in my, you can see there's an empty coffee cup there. You, you often will see them in the background here because I'm often so much in my creative process that I'm just like, drink, 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 put that over there, like back to my creative process. Um, I'm so focused on the important stuff that I'm like not really focused on the periphery peripheral activity, which is cleaning up afterwards. So energetic hygiene and everything I'm teaching you about here is pretty much cleaning up. And you have to clean up to be able to then have the freedom, clarity, expansiveness to be able to keep going in your life. And so cleaning up in terms of, so yes. Um, so wait, I, I fragmented myself there. I wanted to say cleaning up in terms of your non-physical body means processing things emotionally. And that's part of it. Processing things emotionally sometimes means like you sit and you think, or sometimes you talk to yourself about it. Sometimes you talk to another friend about what one friend said. Sometimes you journal, or sometimes you just exist. And that is, you know, you're, you're metabolizing it and processing it. And then the other part that I fragmented to was yes, even orgasm is an aspect of quote unquote cleaning up. In fact, I would say it is one of the most direct ways of cleaning up and restructuring your inner non-physical aspect of self and realigning everything. Um, so for, okay, we do energetic hygiene for a large part when we are asleep at night. So getting good sleep and good rest is essential for this. When there, it happens on a physical level. And why is this? Because in order to do a lot of this type of energetic hygiene, you have to turn off your basic daily waking intellect. And most people don't take time to do that during the day unless you dun, 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 meditate and do mindfulness. And I'm sure that there are in my beautiful class here, a lot of people who do meditation and mindfulness. So I know I don't have to teach, tell you or encourage you. You're probably already on the path and already have a practice. But that for those of us who are on the path of spiritual attainment, we already either set aside conscious time where you might sit. And when you sit in meditation, that's one time when you might process emotionally. When you're like, mm, a thought arose, 
that was a thing or mm, a feeling that was a thing. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like, um, not to be whatever gross about it, but like, you know, when you're like on the toilet and you're like, yep, that was a thing. That was a thing that I experienced and I had it and I ate it and now it went out. Like you feel things going out of you. That's kind of what meditation is kind of like, oh yeah, that's just passing through, passing through, passing through, passing through. You want to let these things pass through. So you practice meditation in order to have things pass through and you want things to have, you want to have a fast um, energetic metabolism. So if you have something happen to you in the morning, you want to process it that day. You want to actually process it in the moment. If you have a really fast set of chakras that are moving like fast bicycle wheels, like the Tour de France, and let's say someone says something to you in the moment, um, it can be anything like a backhanded compliment. You know, sometimes um, someone says something. I'm just trying to think of an example of a backhanded compliment. Like, like um, that blue shirt looks so much better on you than that other red shirt you were wearing the other day. You kind of stop for a moment. You're like, like, thank you, but also, huh? Like, cause they're saying like, you look nice today, but you didn't look nice the other day. So when you have a slow energetic metabolism, you don't say anything in the moment, you kind of go home and you, cause your gears kind of grinded in that moment, like uh, 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 uh. lack of bliss is the gears grinding in your transmission. You kind of go home and you're like, or you sit in the first moment that you have to kind of like sit in reflection. You're like, who does he think he is? And what is he saying? And what, what was wrong with my red shirt? Um, and these are just like made up examples to try to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. But uh, those are like the most disempowered experiences when you don't get to respond in the moment, but then you do eventually go home and you poop it out. You're like, okay, like that's what he said. It made me feel like this. It's all water under the bridge now. And then you kind of like brush yourself off get your chakras from being wibble wobbly back to being like in alignment and then go on with your emotional experience of your day. The best things are when your Tour de France wheels are moving very, very fast. And someone says like, huh, that blue shirt looks so much better than that red shirt that you were wearing the other day. And you kind of process it in the moment. And you're like, gears are grinding, crunch, crunch, crunch. And you say to them like, wait, what? What are you talking about? Did I look bad the other day? Why, why didn't you say something about it then? Or why are you saying this? Or you respond to it in the moment. Those are the best things because it's just so frustrating when you, you know, leave a social situation. You're like, oh, like that's what I should have said. Um, so it has everything to do with energetic metabolism and it's only burdensome. A lot of people become introverted and they don't want to interact with other people or go to parties because they're like, oh, dirty laundry. Dirty coffee cups. I'm um, because you're supposed to go to parties and be like, woohoo, I'm meeting people and talking, doing stuff and having fun and socializing. But for a lot of people, it's 100% like a veiled insult here. Did someone say something mean to me here? I said the wrong thing there. Oops, I really stepped in a pile of poop there. And then go home instead of feeling energized and positive with a giant pile of dirty laundry to do. Like, oh no, all of these things that I'm thinking and feeling as an end result of social interaction. So social interaction is supposed to be fun, uplifting, and nourishing, not something that just gives you a giant emotional backlog of things that you then have to process. So sometimes it can be good to fast socially, meaning just staying away from people, going through your inner process. You know what's my way, because I'm not that much of just like a sitting type of meditator. I'm a walking type of meditator where I really like to walk. I like to walk with my dog. And also I like to use, like I've got this indoor exercise thing, or I used to go to a gym, something that's just repetitive rhythmic movements, do these repetitive rhythmic movements. And it kind of helps my intellect quiet down. And then my intellect isn't thinking. And then my emotions come forward and I can kind of think, feel, and process my emotions. I'm like, oh, that happened. And then I felt like this. And then I'm like, oh, get that thing out of there. We're done with that. Moving onward. And then kind of, you know, rise higher again. Um, so um, yeah, exercise and cardio is an excellent aspect of energetic hygiene. It not only gets your physical metabolism through oxygenation and cellular respiration to go into your backlog of stored emotional experiences, which is stored as fats and glucose in your body. And then you kind of work through them, literally burn off those experiences as you burn off those calories and then come into a state of clarity. Um, but it, it is like, it, it's an empowering sense of like, if I'm feeling angry or upset, like do some exercise and then it kind of gets 
it is a relief of the burden of the things that made you feel angry or upset. So all of these things, they're, I'm presenting them like in a very haphazard way. I should start off with like the non-physical energy practices. So there are things that are about the cultivation of the non-physical body or the light body. Meditation and mindfulness. Meditation can be sitting quietly and observing your thoughts. Meditation can be, uh, like I said, doing some kind of rhythmic patterned exercise or something like that. Mindfulness is very much related. And that's when like you're sweeping the floor or doing the dishes or doing, I like it when I'm gardening or some other thing like that. A task that requires a small amount of your processing power, but not the totality of your processing power so that you can then be free to spend some time processing your emotions and pulling weeds. Like we just had, we have had a lot of rain that made a lot of weeds grow in our garden. And the ground is also like not rock hard. So it's actually a perfect time to be like, ah, oh, there's all of these weeds. I just need to like, I'm like, just give me 15 minutes. It's a very, it's not mindless task, but a, something that's a perfect thing. Like it involves my hands, my body, and gives my mind the freedom and my emotions, the freedom to just like feel what I need to feel. And then at the end of it, like you've weeded the garden and you have a pile of weeds and a sense of accomplishment. So a win-win on every level. Um, my, so meditation and mindfulness are a huge part of energy hygiene. And the reason for this is because our minds usually keep us like constantly distracted, like pay attention to me, pay attention to me, listen to this, listen to this. Can't really focus with our attention, tendril of attention, uh, and be attentive to the emotional aspect of self, which is a big part of energetic hygiene. So um, being able to um, take time consciously to turn off or press pause on your intellect in order to be able to feel the less loud aspects of your being, like listen to for the little tiny piccolos that are in the symphony of who and what you are and not just like the loudest trumpets or, you know, timpani drums or something like that. Um, so being able to tune in and listen to those things. So a lot of energetic hygiene happens for that reason, for most people um, in unconsciousness, sub or super consciousness when you're asleep. So some of that processing is literally neurological. Here is what happens neurologically when you go to sleep at night. Your brain takes all of the sensations and information and things that you have accrued during the day, and it begins to organize and file them away. And I use the analogy, it is like when you go to the grocery store and then you come home and you unpack everything out of your grocery bags and you put it all out like on the countertops or on the kitchen table and you look at it and then you're like, okay, like these are going to have to go into the refrigerator. These are going to have to go into these storage bins. These will go into the cupboards over here. These will go into, you know, this hanging wire basket over here. The bananas will go in the banana rack. Um, all of these things go where they belong. That is what your brain does neurologically with the information and sensations that you accrued during the day. So again, during the day, most people are too stimulated, 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 bouncing from um, experience to experience in order to, for the brain to even have a moment to organize itself and organize all of the information that you've taken in. This is literally the transition translation from short-term memory into long-term memory storage. So you have that in your brain, short-term memory. Like if I asked you guys to remember the, the uh, number string, like, you know, five, three, two, seven, be like, okay, I remember five, three, two, seven, five, three, two, seven, but you're not going to remember it forever you know, and then, um, but if you wanted to remember it forever, like a song that you're trying to memorize, or when you're, you know, young, and you're trying to memorize, like, do George Washington's, um, uh, you know, when he was president, and all the things you have to memorize from school, that's what happens when you go to sleep at night, that all the things that you learn during the day, get processed from short-term storage into long-term storage. And that is also very similar to like saying that you got like five bucks or whatever, or you got some amount of money or something that is valuable and you want to invest it in something that is long-term, not just 
fast cash, like cash goes in your wallet, goes right out the door. You spend it on stuff. But let's say you translate that cash into a diamond or into a bar of gold. You're saving it for the long-term storage. That is exactly what our brains do. And our brains also do this thing when we are asleep at night of um, combing through everything we've experienced and getting rid of extraneous knowledge. So if I said, remember this short number string, you know, five, two, eight, seven, and you're like, okay, I'm going to remember that, but I ain't going to remember that for the rest of my life. That's because when you go to sleep at night, your brain and your higher self is amazing. It's going to be like, like, what's this crap all up? Get rid of it. We don't need it. We don't need it. Cause it's just like when I go through my phone and you look through all of your pictures and videos, hopefully you do this, or your emails, and you're like, don't need it, don't need it, don't need it, don't need it, no longer relevant, never, never relevant or not relevant anymore. And you get rid of all that stuff because you have a limited amount of storage on your phone. You have a limited amount of storage in your brain. And it's absolutely essential to get rid of extraneous information and that things that end up being like the empty unwashed coffee cups in your brain that make it difficult for you to walk across the floor in a flow state. So your brain needs to do all of that. That's just on a neurological level that can be measured by objective science. But so much more happens when you are asleep. So also on a, on a physicality level, when you go into deep sleep and into REM sleep, and when you don't have to do um, using your neurology for moving your skeletal muscles, arms and legs, um, that is when your body goes into deep cleaning. That your body is like, oh good, I'm gonna digest everything in the digestive tract. And if there's nothing left to digest in the digestive tract, then I'm going to go into autophagy, autophagy, that is combing through the body, looking for anything that needs to not be there. I'm so the empty coffee cups, like you go through your rooms, you're like, cancer, dead cell, dead cell, dead cell, all of you get out of here, you're not supposed to be here. Um, and that is what your body does um, at night. It does a regenerative process. So clearing out stuff that's dead and generating new stuff in terms of your basic somatic cellular processes. But at night, one of the most amazing things that happens in your time body is that your chakras that might have been like wibbly wobbly all over the place, finally get into alignment again. And this is, of course, ideal. Um, we face a lot of challenges right now in this time, which is why I, in terms of energy practices, I wanted to just do a completely extemporaneous talk, not based on 10 years ago, because we have so much crap all this 5G extraneous frequency crapola and many, many things. And a lot of things that inhibit or um, crap up my dreams. So my dreams are not always 100% rejuvenative and my dreams are not always 100% representative of my processing um, experience. Ideally, when we sleep at night and we release the iron stronghold of the intellect and verbalized mind, we connect to the source again. And the source gives us downloads of information from your higher self that are then of course interpreted through your cultural and symbolic interpretation system that come out as dreams that gives you information and guidance about your life and sometimes it might be something like at whatever i had a dream you know that family member and then they might be like wow like what is that saying about them and sometimes i think about it or i call them up and i tell them like i had a dream about you and they're like let's talk about it, it gives you an opportunity to talk about it but not some dreams are just detritus like uh i don't know I was thinking about putting away the mixer, like the KitchenAid mixer in the closet in wakefulness. And then I dreamed about it in, um, in my dreaming time. And then I woke up and I was like, oh, that dream was just a stupid dream about my KitchenAid mixer. Like it doesn't mean anything, it's not deep. It's not anything other than just the detritus debris of daily waking consciousness. That's in ordinary times. Right now, we do have this unwholesome influence through biochemistry manipulation via frequency warfare from AI and other non-terrestrial, non-natural consciousness sources that are influencing our consciousness and our DNA. So you also now have to add into the mix a new variable. Like, am I really experiencing this from my higher self, from the source? from the detritus of the day, or is this some kind of unwholesome AI trying to talk to me, through me, or influence me? That's important because I've been getting 
tons of dreams that are not just about my own hopes or fears or things that I've experienced or any kind of thing that I have to learn from my higher self, but which are very, very much things that are trying to influence me or control my behavior. I feel negatively something that should not be there. Be like, get out, you don't belong here, um, coming into my dreams at night. And I think I'm not the only one. And I think I'll probably get people either in the chat here affirming that or in the comments section later. And again, continued thanks to the YouTube comments section because I get the best people and the best comments. Like my enrolled students and people on Patreon are all wonderful. And I thank you for being here. And then I also find that the people that are regular viewers on my YouTube channel are just wonderful people. And I get very beautiful um, sharings and insightful comments from there. So thank you to the comment section of all participants. But um, I will affirm to you that uh, if you've noticed your dreams changing within the past two years or so, and again, it is based upon the substrate of lies, the frequency warfare, um, uh, imprisonment system, imprisonment system isn't the right word, but um, the thing that has subsumed, um, been louder than, the natural frequencies that we should really be tuned into. So energy hygiene matters a lot um, because you need to clear out the stuff that's not the real you. So it, the same basic principles apply. If I have a conversation with person B over there and then that conversation about person B telling me they didn't like my red sweatshirt or whatever it was, bouncing around inside of me, their words or their emotions or their influence on me bouncing around inside of me, affecting or afflicting me on my time trajectory. I need to process that stuff out of me. Or it could be something that happened to you when you were in third grade, whatever it is, you need to process that stuff out of you so that you can then have a clear journey. Just like I need to pick up my dirty coffee cups in the middle of my room or my pajamas or whatever it is so I can walk across the floor and not stumble across things. You get it? Having a clear pathway in front of you. This is, this is everything that we're doing both non-physically and also physically, non-literally, metaphorically and literally because cleaning up your house is also part of this. Moving house, cleaning house, cleaning up your car, all of these things are part of energy hygiene. And you're like, oh, Aurora, I don't like where this is going. You make us do math and you make us do molecular chemistry. And now you're gonna tell us to clean our, our room. I'm like, yes, I'm gonna make you do your homework and make you clean your room. Um, Cause I have to clean my room. Um, we're all gonna clean our rooms, um, but really it's important stuff because the outside reflects the inside. So first on these levels of pure energy, meditation, mindfulness, and let's do sun gazing. I have not really told you enough about the mechanics of sun gazing and it relates to orgasm and sexual pleasure and gratification, but it's not the same, but it has the same pathways of energy going up your spine. It feels like it's going up your spine because we're not no longer in that time but we will be in that time again when every step is an orgasm and every step is euphoric and you're constantly connected as a battery conduit like anode and cathode between the earth and, and the sun and the stars. Um, so what is sun gazing like to me? Because I haven't exemplified this enough. And we've had weeks and weeks and weeks of clouds here, but I started doing some sun gazing out the window and I realized I had to really show this to you. So as I breathe in, like here's my tendril of attention. Here's the sun in direct line, line of vision coming through my, uh, my window in the morning. My eyes aren't open in the morning. <laughs> I'm like this, I'm squinting. Um, I breathe in. The breathe in is a breathing in through here. It is also a drawing inward, a drawing inward. I'm feeling it filling up my lower energy centers. I feel it filling up my lap or like a bowl that is in my pelvis. I feel it with each breath filling up to my chest, I feel it getting up to this point, my high heart. And then as I feel it coming up to here, I haven't shown this to you enough. My chin tilts upward, my pineal gland, instead of sticking forward, points upward. And I feel all of these chakras get a sun bath, if that makes sense. Like I'm tuned in, I'm tuned in, I'm tuned in, breathing, 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 in, 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 in. I'm starting to feel very, very, very full. I tilt upward. As I tilt upward, I arch my back and all of this energy comes up through all of these chakras here. It goes upward, 
out through here and out through here, out in through the back of my head, out through the front of my head and connects with the sun. Although I don't always make that ankh shape. And I've said in many times, like, I'm not sure if that's relevant anymore because I wasn't sure if that is a control system that is a vestigial trace from ancient Egypt. Like in all truthfulness, you know, in esoteric teachings and practices, there were some things that they placed like the grandma's strudel recipe that is um, incomplete. There are some aspects of self-cultivation and esoteric practices where they intentionally put into the recipe, they baked in some limitations and control factors. But I, I definitely feel this sense of the arching of the back, bringing it up, arching my back, my chin tilting upward, and then like a type of kapow where I connect with the sun that that is the most important thing. It's uh, a culmination of a circuit. The circuit is completed in that moment. And that that is also essential energetic hygiene. So that is something that you should try to do at least once a day. You should try to do sun gazing at least once a day, preferably in the morning when the sun is coming up or at night when the sun is going down and um, I mean, sometimes it depends on what my energy needs and light nutrition needs are like, but sometimes I will do it in the middle of the day, but almost always with the hat shaded, with a hat underneath trees or something like that. But the main thing is you're using all of the energy centers that go up and down your spine to create this complete circuit. Okay, so the, those are, I think, basics, and I'll go through my notes just to make sure I got stuff from 10 years ago too, of non-physical energy hygiene. But, um, that, so when you are sleeping, you get a chance to hopefully disconnect your mind and reconnect to self, a higher self and the source, get your chakras in alignment and your body is practicing metabolism, clearing out metabolites, um, you know, autophagy and regenesis. Mm -hmm. um, I also do a lot with my body posture while I am sleeping at night. And again, this has a lot to do with your spine. So in case you're not getting it yet, like the orgasm or Kundalini raising that goes up your spine, the sun gazing that goes up your spine, the arch of the back that is so crucial. And when I sleep at night, so um, Princess Cheeky is in bed right now. She actually pray for her. She's not feeling that positive and was eating some grass today. So master teacher might not be in class, but um, she's sleeping in bed. Um, she's my little spouse and she grumbles a lot because she goes to bed and she just like curls up in, in a ball, like a little lima bean and she just stays put. Not me. I'm totally like the roller coaster. And every time I do my pancaking and my flipping and flopping, she's like, grr, grr, like you're waking me up. You're waking me up. So, okay, just uh, understand that. I'm a very active sleeper and um, I do these things for a reason. So when you lay down on your bed, that's when your spine has the opportunity to kind of like relieve the compression. The crane Cranial sacral fluid is able to kind of refill the interstices and can, the discs, spongy discs, can realign your back. It relieves a huge amount of pressure. Your spine is an antenna. It is when one of the times when you get to recalibrate. So most people don't lie down throughout the day. I do a lot of stuff with my yoga and I'll talk to you about yoga and different physical practices and dance practices too. Um, but for most people, unless you're really making an effort at it, you're standing on your feet for 12 to 16 hours. And then when you lie down at night, that's the first time that your spine has an opportunity to kind of realign. The pressure is taken off. All of the you know, wonderful vertebrae get to be in alignment again. And then the cranial sacral fluid can flow in a uh, in its natural pattern. The natural pattern of the cranial sacred fluid as I stand up is, so it's like a figure eight, like outward this way, in through your belly button, out through the back of your belly, uh, back of your spine, out down around underneath your feet or under your pelvis, back in through here, back up through here, back up through here, and in the opposite direction, up 
through here and down and out through here. And that's an amazing visualization. It's similar to Qigong or any of these energy practices. I hope that you guys practice Qigong or something like that. Energy awareness and energy cultivation practices that help you to become sensitized to your own energy field. So wait, you're like, wait, 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 Aurora, what do you mean? Like my cranial sacral fluid, like does it jump out of my head, out of my eyeballs? And come like, no, 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 not at all. So the energy movements that I just shared with you are kind of like a figure eight, a figure eight where your navel is actually the crossing point, the center of the infinity point. And in your physicality body, there's a mechanical flow of the cranial sacral fluid, which is a neurotransmitter and nutrient rich fluid that bathes your brain and your central nervous system and does not interact with your bloodstream or other body parts directly. It is meant to be pristine and it is meant to be uh, like it bathes your supercomputer and it keeps everything flowing in the right direction. There are little like vesicles at the back of your neck and um, that um, help to pump this circulatory flow. And if you are a person that suffers with like headaches, migraines, and these other problems, a lot of the time it's because there are um, blockages. It's like if you feel on your own um, head um, at the base of your spine where it meets your neck, there are very special places there where there are conduits that help to bring um, the fluid that bathes your brain and cushions your meninges downward through your spine. And then it gets pumped back upward from your spine up into your head. So it's not unidirectional, like gravitation. It's just like the way that your heart pumps blood down to your toes, but then everything doesn't stay at your toes. Your feet would be 10 million miles big. If that happened, the blood goes down to your toes temporarily. And then the heart also pumps it back up to your upper extremities as well. Same thing with your craniosacral fluid that it doesn't just go down to the base of your spine, which is, you know, kind of like right below your pants line or, you know, right, I, I'm, I don't know like how to describe it with delicate language, right above your butt crack is where your, um, um, there's like a reservoir of energy and craniosacral fluid, and it is pumped upward from there and it goes upward to your brain, but it doesn't stay at your brain and it doesn't stay at the base of your spine. It circulates in a figure eight between these two locations. Thank you for allowing me some silliness and indelicacy in what I'm talking about here. Um, and it doesn't just flow in regular straight lines. It actually flows in spiral patterns, spiral patterns up and down and in these amazing figure eights. So um, practices like Qigong really help to be able to move that, that fluid and also be able to move your energy. We're getting to the point where these two things are synonymous, not separate or discrete, but your physicality, substances and fluids are synonymous with your energy. And you want to make sure that everything is flowing effectively. So when you lay down in bed at night, that is one of the few times when it makes it so much easier for these physical fluids to flow because first of all, you're horizontal. There's not the question of gravity and also there's no compression on your spine. And so when I lay down either for dance or for rest, one of the first things I do, and you can do it with me right now, sitting up or you can also lay down and I encourage everyone to do this big giant stretch out like this, like, ah, ah, I'm totally stretching my back the most I possibly can do. And I have a big giant yoga ball too that I use a lot in my daily um, meditations and, and movement practices. Stretching out your spine like that several times a day is what you wanna do for energetic hygiene. Every time I do that, I am moving the metabolites or detritus of emotional crapola, of stuff that I have experienced that is either no longer relevant or 10 mile in, in the re rear view mirror or has already been experienced. It gets processed out of me by doing those motions. And people that, when I do a Zoom video conference with everyone too, like they also know that at a certain point, like 
after a certain number of hours, I try not to do it during this class, but like, I'm going to have to stretch my hips. I'm going to have to stretch my hips like this. I'm going to have to stretch my calves like this. I'm going to have to stretch my calves like this. Like I also stretch my physical body just generally several times throughout the day, lay down on the bed, stretch out your body fully, stretch out your expansiveness of your chest, stretch out the expansiveness of your spine. And then when, uh, and all of this helps your chakras to get calibrated and um, complementary aligned with one another. Then like you fall asleep, sleep, 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 whatever, you're back sleeper, you're a slide sleeper. Many of us wake up or you might not even recognize or register that you're waking up, but you it make, wake up several times in the middle of the night. And you know what I do every time? Big giant stretch. And then I do a twist and I twist and I pancake and I twist and I pancake. And my dog says, Grr, 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 you're waking me up. I didn't sign up for a roller coaster, but that's what I'm getting. And I'm like, I'm very sorry, but this is what I do every night. So um, yes, you might be distressing your spouse or your dogs or pets or animals or whoever you sleep with at night. But um, this is really, really, really what I recommend because I find like there have been a couple of occasions when I've camped in a tent, you know, you get one of those sleeping bags. It's like this narrow and you have to keep yourself together like this. I couldn't, I just couldn't. I had to unzip the thing halfway through, stick my arms and legs out, even though it's cold, do my thing. I can't stay all um, wrapped up, um, mummified up like that um, because I need to do this energy moving. It is part of energetic metabolism. So that's doing stuff at night. All right. And then let's talk about dance, um, flying rainbow lasagna, qigong, and other physical body movement practices, yoga. So all of these also relate to energy hygiene. Anything that is a stretching, like when I tell you like sometimes, yep, I'm so like, I'm sitting like this. I'm like, wow, like my legs are really getting congested. Like my circulation is not really flowing that much down the lower part of my body. Like we're not meant to sit for many, many hours during the day. I stretch all throughout the day. And so I really recommend that you do basic stretching. Stretching not only removes and allows the um, processing and release and transformation of lactic acid. Like after you do lots of exercise and when you go into anaerobic muscle um, building because you've used up all of your oxygen your muscles create lactic acid and that's why your muscles get sore and then the next day you're like ah like my muscles are sore you need to stretch because literally when you stretch out your muscle you are releasing lactic acid body metabolite that is then free to be, um, you know, pr processed out of your body by your metabolism and by, you know, your, your various different fluids, like your bloodstream, your lymph stream, all, all of those good things. Um, stretching. No, I didn't know how to turn something off. Sorry. Someone is trying to like call me. No, good. Okay, good. I don't know who it is or why they're trying to call me at this moment. Um, and they definitely threw me off my path. Hold on, drink some water. And we'll talk about structured water too. No problem, no problem, no problem. Um, stretching just on a basic level has physical biomechanical changes and improvements like the release of lactic acid and the increase of certain circulations. Stretching as it relates to yoga is hugely important for energetic hygiene. Yoga, the original word means joining together or divine union. And literally these body postures, which are non-competitive. Like I know it's hard guys, because I go on Instagram like anybody does. And I see people that do amazing back bends or handstands or any of these things. And you're like, wow, like they look so amazing. It's hard not to compare yourself to them. And it is hard not to be in competition but yoga has nothing at all to do with a comparison to another person, trying to look like a picture, a video, or a yoga magazine, or any type of competition. Yoga is truly a journey where the only comparative measure is yourself and where you have been on your own journey. And even then, it is not like trying to say, when I was 28, I could do this type of a leg bend, but now I'm, you know, whatever, 87, and I can only do this type of a leg bend. 
It is not like that at all. These are, your spine is an antenna. Your entire body is a genetic antenna and doing certain body movements and postures helps you to tune into your higher self. Um, not every posture feels good or is appropriate to each person. So you have to fine tune what you're doing and you also have to fine tune what you're doing for your journey. Because if your back is feeling fragile, it might be like, oh, it is not time for me to do back bends today. You know what I mean? You only do the things that are in literal alignment with your timeline of optimum longevity and coherence and frictionless bliss. So you do the movements that are the correct movements for you, the exact customized, tailor-made um, prescription, for lack of a better word, of the things that you need to do in order to be in divine alignment. That is what yoga is. So yoga is about spiritual attainment. It is non-denominational. You are not um, um, cheating on your God by going there. It's not like, oh no, they went to, to cheat, cheating on Jesus by going over to the Hindus because you're doing yoga. No, because I know that that is a real concern amongst some people about whether it is um, you know, whatever, inappropriate, whether you're culturally misappropriating something that isn't yours to do. It is absolutely yours to do. If you have a human body and a divine connection, it is yours to do. You don't have to have a particular belief system. Yoga is non-denominational and it is a form of devotion. It is a devotion of your body and your spirit and your energy body connecting to your higher self and to the source and most importantly to creative life force energy. All the practices that I'm telling you about right now are about how to connect and cultivate creative life force energy. So you do these certain body postures that help you to do those things. They help you to clear the debris. That's what stretching is, clearing out the conduit so that energy can flow most effectively making it so that the energy is actually flowing there. So like, you know, you can have a perfectly clear riverbed that's dry. You don't want that. You want to clear out your riverbed or make sure your garden hose is clear and not, not knotted up. Then you want to have the water is turned on, which is creative life force energy. Um, uh, and Melissa, I'm going to get to your questions. Hold on a moment. Um, or comments or sharings. And then you want to make sure that those pathways, energy pathways, stay open. So yoga is very, very important because I find that it really does stuff with um, stretching muscles, stretching tendons, flexibility, and strength. And muscle building is important. And you guys can tell from my body, like I do a lot with muscle building. And I also do a lot with flexibility because I think that those things go hand in hand. So muscle building is part of like kind of like tiny injuries that happen to our body. Like when you stress your muscles, they get a little bit injured and then stem cells go in there and your body's like, gotta make these muscles stronger. And that's part of it. But you wanna make sure that like, you know, when you're like combing your dog or your cat, like, or brushing a dog or cat, everything goes in the right direction. You don't comb or, or pet the cat in the opposite direction. Like, ugh, like even the thought of that should, should make you cringe go with the fur, with the fur, all right? I have to teach, teach people how to pet a dog and cat. You guys know, I don't have to teach you. Um, you wanna do that with your muscles. You wanna do that with the organization and cultivation of your body. You wanna build muscle fibers, but you wanna have them go with the fur, not against the fur. And that is a big part of what flexibility is. So muscle building, muscle fiber building, and also um, the flexibility and cultivation of energy that makes these muscles work together harmoniously. Melissa's comment now says, I learned about Qigong and its many practices back in 2005, and I studied in craniosacral and myofacial therapies afterwards. And all three therapies incorporate the theme of healthy flow, just like water in the importance of flow and certain water type movement with body and thought. Your explanations are awesome, Aurora. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa, for sharing. Thank you for saying that. And yes, I'm happy. Thank you for sharing your practices with us. Happy that you mentioned myofascial because that's a big part of it. So I didn't mention the fascia of your body. Fascia are the clear membranes that um, surround 
an actual muscle and kind of organize all of those fibers. And fascia are where we store a lot of negative emotional responses. This, again, if you go to a party and someone insults your red shirt, it gets stored in your myofascial um, structure of your body. Uh, enough of a burden of um, unreleased emotional stuff can make a person kind of like literally hunched over. Uh, it can make you feel literally burdened. I talk about the boulders on people's shoulders, it can bring people's shoulders down, literally, um, can bring people's faces down. Um, the down feeling of what people affiliate or interpret as aging is in many parts unprocessed emotional stuff, usually negative emotional stuff. We hardly ever carry in the, as a burden in our, in our fascia, like a wonderful positive surprise. Like someone threw me a surprise birthday party and then I had to process that emotion. That is hardly ever stored within us. Um, but uh, oftentimes insults, injuries, things that were unpleasant, those we kind of file away. Just like when you eat something that your body is not prepared to deal with, your body's like, store it up, store it up as glucose and store it up as fat. We'll deal with that later. And at a certain point, you have to go into those storage units, emotional and physical and energetic storage units and clear it out. And that's big stuff. So stretching helps with the fascia a lot. And then there are many professional um, modalities where you can have someone else help you. And I also, in um, my FRL dance class, I use this a lot. This is an amethyst and it has like a smooth end and has a pointy end. I do that a lot for going in. Some people, you know, you can go to a practitioner, they use all these different tools on you. Some people use these blades that are kind of like almost scraping tools. They do make slight injuries but the injuries then help the entirety to heal. So it's kind of interesting, but there are ways of being able to do stretching and deep massages, mechanical releases of the energy that is a part of the physical body so that the energy can flow and you can then, um, again, like have a, a free, a frictionless flow state to be able to then really contain more joy. So when I teach my FRL dance class, I do a ton of stretches that are all about like the pelvis, joints, hips, where your legs meet your body and being able to essentially be more flexible there. But it's really about releasing negative stored emotions in the joy centers. And let's go to the picture and I'll show you the joy centers, making room for more joy. When you, so that your joy centers are these orange, giant balls that you see here, like this hip over here and this hip over here, technically that's where we are supposed to store our joy. And if you've ever seen like a little child, like skipping along, gamboling along, or the way that a baby goat kind of runs, they like, they run like, dun, 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 like they prance, they prance along. It's because they have giant orange joy centers that are right here. And also what humans interpret as quote unquote, a sexy way of walking is actually a way that represents health and vitality. When you walk in a way that emphasizes the joy centers here, when you walk, 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 there, you know, all of these ways that are interpreted as like, oh, look at that, like very, very sexy walking. Um, but what it really is, is movements that cultivate and represent health and vitality, which in this world are then projected upon and interpreted largely as either sexual display or sexual attractiveness. But what's really going on is humans are interpreting health and vitality as that looks like a positive sexual partner. That looks like someone that I would like to interact with because yes, again, you know, I hope that this is not like in introductory material for anyone that is, um, hasn't explored or developed their own sexuality yet, but positive and healthy sexual relations, intimacy between partners has everything to do with having um, healthy flow and positive energetic bank accounts that that is it. So, but I want people to know that when you cultivate your joy centers and you're prancing or walking or swinging your hips, that that is really 
can be a non-self-conscious, non-sexual display of health and vitality, which is really what energetic hygiene is. So many people in this world, in order not to receive unwanted sexual attention, do not move their bodies in these perfect figure eight movements that are the representation of the expression of cultivated health and vitality, because it is considered to be not business appropriate or you know, um, not appropriate for a situation. Like you wouldn't walk that way at a funeral. You know what I mean? Or maybe in church or something like that. Um, but they close down certain energy centers or physical body parts because of the social interpretations or projections of others. And I am absolutely here in order to you encur to encourage you. You know, I don't want you to get arrested or anything like that. I don't want you to get kicked out of church, but I want you to be free in your body. I want you to blow past cultural conventions and I want you to decolonize your posture. I talk about this a lot in my dance class too, in the sense of I go barefoot a lot. Um, I wear sandals most of the time, being back in touch with my feet stretching all the time and make, making um, body cultivation normative. And again, I've been here for over 20 years at this point. Now I notice in social situations, you know, it was refreshing. I was at one place that was like a, a circle gathering. People were talking and everybody was going to have an opportunity to say something. First, we went around introducing ourselves. And one woman said, I'm blah, blah, blah. And please don't mind me, but I have to stand up and stretch and move around a lot. Like that's just part of who I am. And um, like kind of like asking for permission in advance. And I said to her afterwards, I loved that you did that because it gave me permission. Cause I'm usually too like, like I'm like, I'm trying to fit in. Like I'm cool, I'm trying to fit in. Um, not be too wiggly and not be too standing up and stretching and doing weird things during the middle of social experiences but now it is becoming more normative because you know what? Um, like sitting for several hours, like your butt's gonna fall asleep. This is not normal. This is not what we're made for. Normalize that in social situations to be able to get up, stand up, walk around, stretch your body, stretch your legs, stretch your back, or lie down, lie down on the floor and do your stretches. And um, I love that that has become more normal in our world. And also like I used to, for, for many years, like wear, colorfully printed yoga pants just as like a part of my daily outfit which got a little bit of side eye like who do you think you are wearing those those are for the gym those are not for but now it's regular because it's very very difficult to do your stretches and things like that if you wear you know whatever constricting denim or something that has like a tight waistband I design all of my clothing that I wear every day um and that you know I share with others professionally on my website that so that you can stretch you can dance, you can do all these things because that is literally how I live my life. So I am trying to exemplify that to everyone. Um, uh, positive cultivation of life force energy through free movements of your body that is not about sexual attractiveness, uh, hoping to attract a sexual partner that is just about health and vitality. So that's a big thing here because I guess the theme that I'm trying to come upon is um, energetic hygiene and having these energy centers in balance and flowing effectively is beauty. That is my definition of what beauty is different than the sense of whatever the cover of a fashion magazine or many videos or things that we see now in our social media that are considered to be beautiful. I consider beauty to be the culmination and the pinnacle of health and vitality for each person, for each person to whatever is your pinnacle of your own body expression to be able to, to you at your utmost to be that is what it is to be beautiful as opposed to a cookie cutter um standard of what beauty is like your foot must be this many inches long or whatever your earlobe must be this many inches long um that that those are arbitrary standards but that what i am really encouraging everyone to recalibrate towards is to recalibrate towards health and vitality especially in the movement and metabolism of our bodies. 
So I also got to emotional health and well-being, which is when you are emotionally healthy and you're on bicycle wheels and moving fast, like the Tour de France, if someone says something that's mean or cutting or even like tangentially kind of a little bit mean, you respond to it right away. You process it right there. Someone steps on your toes. You'd be like, hey, like you just stepped on my toes. And it gives the other person an opportunity to, to recalibrate, reassess, and to apologize in the moment. Otherwise, you get a backlog and they never learn. So it's actually very, very positive. Emotional health for you and emotional health for others as you practice this energetic hygiene. So I got yoga, yes. Um, craniosacral is amazing. If you guys don't know what that is, I highly recommend it. I know a wonderful practitioner that is in Oxnard, California, who does for both humans and dogs. And I bring my dog there too. It is very, very gentle release techniques where you are laying down horizontally on like a massage table and they might put different foam blocks or other things like that um, uh, to elevate certain body parts in order to be able to change the twist of your spine slightly. Like you might need to twist slightly to this side or slightly to this side and also very, very gentle pulling on that area that I was talking about, the area where your brain, where your skull meets your neck. And that's a place, um, you know, suffering from convulsive seizures over many, many years, had many, many difficulties with that area of my body. Cranial sacral really, really helped balance and regulate that flow through my body. It is not the same as chiropractic because a lot of people are afraid of like, you go to the chiropractor and they crack your back. It is not like that at all. It is very, very gentle adjustments. I would recommend it almost for anyone. Yes, you can even do it on an infant. And Melissa says, while attending massage school in Cambridge, I learned firsthand how the body stores and releases undigested emotions in the body. It was an amazing thing to learn and very empowering to realize how to help. Thank you for that. And thank you for being a practitioner. And I help, thank you for helping people. And I truly hope that people will become able to access that particular technique to be able to know about this and learn about this because if you don't know about this like it's really like living in a straitjacket. like you're very very closed up and stuck like this and as soon as you start to learn about this capacity to be free in your body you can clean you can I don't even know how to describe it. Like, imagine if you never knew that you could take, I could take that coffee cup and I could put it in the sink or the dishwasher and I could wash out like all the coffee residue and it could be all nice and clean again. Like, what if you never knew that in your body? So I'm really, really encouraging everyone towards finding the modalities, practitioners and personal practices that they can in their life. So yeah, almost every day I do really, really good stuff with massaging my body, um, doing different types of stretching and exercises, doing muscle building exercises, doing my flying rainbow lasagna dance, which is a dance of pure freedom. So um, all of those things really matter. Now let's get into some physical practicality stuff. The last thing I'm gonna end on is structuring water, but first I wanna talk about clean your room. Clean your room, kids, clean your room. So clean your room, why does this matter? Because the outside reflects the inside and everything that you're seeing with your eyes absolutely affects your mind, body, emotional state, and neurology. So if you have sleep problems, you got to clean up your bedroom. You got to clean up your piles of dirty laundry. You got to clear everything out of your bedroom that's not supposed to be there. You got to clear distractions out of your bedroom. You got to have your bedroom be a perfect, nice, clean place that when you get into your bed, you look around and you don't see a pile of things to do. And you also, if you have difficulty sleeping, you don't want to do things like read your be in bed, do your emails in bed. Like your bed is just for sleeping or your bed is just for sexual or private activities. You do not do anything other than restful or, you know, um, uh, whatever orgasmic activities in your bed. That's it. That's all that the bedroom is supposed to be for. And that's very, very tough because a lot of people, it's like they have the TV in the bedroom or they're using it for a home office or any of those things. But just be aware that whatever you are around, you're in in its energy field. So when I am here, this is a separate room in my house where I have my artwork and my music and my lasagna dancing and exercise stuff. And when I come in here, my body's like, oh, like I'm ready to exercise or I'm ready to make music or I'm ready to make um, artwork. And 
like I would find it very difficult to just like sleep restfully in here because everything that I look at and that I am marinating in is a to-do project. Like I, I got to work on that and I'm working on that and I got to clean that up and I got to do that and I have to respond to these emails and I have to do all these things. And that's positive. Like you want to have that space in your life, but then you also energetic hygiene want to have a beautiful, quiet respite. That is also a space where you go to at night, where you turn off your daily responsibilities and don't do that stuff. And don't get me started also like on bathroom stuff because technically bathroom stuff, the bathroom should just be for bathroom stuff, like taking a shower or a bath, doing what you do on the toilet. But I know that almost everyone I know is texting on the toilet. This is just a modern thing. It wasn't even in my notes from 10 years ago, but almost everybody is doing that. And it is uh, an unspoken little thing, um, but that's because most people feel very, very pressed for time. So it actually is not the best for us and for our energetic hygiene, um, because you're in, literally like ingesting new emotional experiences, even as your body is processing through your excretions, previous emotional experiences. So being in the bathroom should be just about releasing the stuff that you've already ingested. It shouldn't be about ingesting new stuff, but almost everybody does some form of entertaining themselves or reading or texting or something in while they're busy excreting. Not the best practices, but again, don't be judgmental of yourself or others. It is often because people are just extremely pressed for time. And that that is when like, sometimes that's the only privacy that some parents have also. It's just like, the, everybody's driving me crazy. Like I'm just gonna take five minutes in the bathroom and that's when they have like five minutes to whatever, you know, shop on eBay or something like that. Um, but that's not how it's supposed to be for us. So energetic hygiene, um, clean your room. Why do you have to clean your room? Because the outside reflects the inside. And because if you can't walk across your floor without tripping over like your sweaters and your dirty socks and your coffee cups and all of those things, then you're not gonna have a frictionless, blissful flow state inside. And everything about energetic hygiene is about moving from moment to moment in a frictionless, blissful state. So here I am in my art studio. And like I confess to you, a lot of the time I'm here, I'm snacking, I'm eating. And then I'm like, okay, back to my project right away. I'm not gonna bring everything over to the kitchen, wash everything up perfectly. Cause like I'm in my, my creative zone. Like I don't wanna have to stop in order to be able to then tidy everything up and then get back to my painting. But what that means is that I then get in accumulation of like dishes, like my, my dog's dishes, dog food dishes, all these different things all around here. And then it does um, become very like cluttered. The clutter outside is what you are marinating in. And it's absolutely essential to organize your space and then also to clean your space. So organ clean is like get rid of anything that might carry mold and fungus and you know gross stuff like that, dirty dishes. But then organize is also important and that is, these are two separate things, but that they are external activities that have everything to do with the reflection of the state of what is happening inside of you. So you must, if you want to be organized in your energy body and in the flow state of your non-physical ephemeral aspect of self and pure consciousness, you must take care of and organize your physical state around you. On a physical level, like when I do my little 15 minutes of pulling weeds out there, it gives me literally a brain chemical lift that is called the serotonin lift. And you can uh, experience that anytime you have a to-do list. I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this. When you get something done on your to-do list, check mark. And you're like, yes, serotonin lift. That's what that is. And I literally make to-do lists for myself so that I can get the serotonin lift of checking things off or the satisfaction of clearing a small patch of my garden outside. It's like, here's a big area. There's a lot, we have a lot of rain guys. We have like, our grass is like this tall. We never get this much rain. Um, so you don't have to do it all in one day. Cause you know what, that would be backbreaking uh, labor. And uh, you know, like it would be very unpleasant. That would not be a serotonin lift. A serotonin lift is when you're like, you know something, let me just do this for like five or 15 minutes as for as long as it is comfortable. And then you see you have done whatever, like a three foot square and you're like, yes, like I got three feet cleared. 
And that's important to celebrate incremental goals in the things that you're doing. You don't have to only get the check mark when you climb to the top of the mountain. You can get that check mark when you reach base camp. And you can get that check mark when you then get to the next ledge. And you can get that check mark when you then get to the next ledge. And then also when you summit the in entirety of the mountain. So I bring this up because most people are very overwhelmed. If I say, yep, clean and organize your whole entire house. Most people are like, eh, eh, I don't like that feeling. Um, yeah, it's a lot because I'm sure you've got like closets, pantries, garages, attics and basements, all these things. They all represent aspects of your life especially if you're carrying around a lot of stuff from your previous um, decades of life. And I don't have that much stuff because I'm a galactic walk-in, but some people have been carrying around stuff, you know, from like their grade school days. They've still got their scrapbook from, um, you know, 11th grade, or um, they've still got their whatever, you know, memorabilia is what I'm trying to talk about. And you don't have to throw this stuff away. Again, I don't throw my coffee cup out the window because it's dirty, but what you need to do is organize it. And you also need to make certain that you are carrying with you in your energy field, only the things that you wish to carry with you in your energy field. So this is what I say to people when they are moving house. It's an opportunity, it's the outside reflects the inside. And this is an opportunity to reassess any object in your energy field. When you look at the world in this way, things become an energetic hygiene, not just a random thing. Like the truth is that coffee cup is not just a random thing for me in my life. It is an intentionally chosen object and I have it for a reason. I don't actually have 10 million coffee cups. I have three and I have the three that I like and I have the three that I need. And I don't want to have the clutter of 10 million coffee cups. I want to have just the ones that I like and that are meaningful to me. So you surround yourself with the objects that are meaningful and useful to you that you want to have in your energy field. This is part of energetic hygiene. So not everybody has the same prescription or um, customized weightlifting program because some people are collectors or they hoard stuff and gather stuff together and they like to have lots of stuff. And those are the people that I would say to them, clean your room, get rid of stuff. And some people don't have a lot of stuff. And I might say to them, you need to get stuff. Like, you know, you might need to have more than one coffee cup. You might need to have a couple because one might be in, you know, in your art studio that you drank stuff out of yesterday. You're allowed to have more than one. Some people need to hear that message. Some people need to hear the message get rid of extraneous stuff, just like in your body. Some people might need to lose weight, lose fat. Some people might, might need to gain weight, gain muscle. It's not a one size fits all scenario, but the basics of this are what you recognize that your home environment, your car, you know, my car right now has tons and tons of garden soil that I need to go to the car wash and vacuum stuff out of there because I've been transporting soil for my various different gardening projects. Um, it reflects everything when I, and every time I go into my car, I'm like, yep, got to do that thing. Got to vacuum that stuff out. Do you understand? It becomes a energetic drain on you. The more that you look at a task that needs to be done, at a certain point, you must make the energy assessment. If it will cost me five units of energy to do the vacuuming out of my car, and every time I look at that stuff that needs to be vacuumed, if it's costing me one unit of energy, if I look at it five times, at a certain point, I'm going to do better. If I just clean the thing up that needs to be cleaned up, because otherwise it is simply becoming a drain on your energy, energetic hygiene. So you start to look around at your environment and you realize everything that is a, a, a unaccomplished task that needs to be done is literally an energy drain. Because when you look at it, you're gonna be thinking, gotta do that thing, gotta do that thing. When you do the thing, you get the serotonin lift. When you don't do the thing, you, it drains you and you look at it thinking, I got to do the thing. I got to do the thing. So at a certain point, you have to make the assessment. Maybe I should just do the thing and then not be drained by me looking at having not done the thing. And the thing can also be make a phone call. Sometimes it's a difficult phone call or sometimes it's just something on your list for someone that you haven't called in a while. And every time you think about it, it's like, ah, got to make that phone call. Got to do that thing got to pay that parking ticket, got to do that thing. 
Do you guys know I still have parking tickets from San Diego and I'm still working on paying them? Oh my goodness, I got to do the thing. And at a certain point you realize that thinking about doing the thing and having that drain on you is costing you more than the cost of actually paying the parking ticket. So you you look at all of these, um, you look at all of, you, you make an assessment in your environment as to how to do these things. Get stuff done, and then you have better energetic hygiene and you have more energy available to you and you feel uplifted and then you can do more. Just like when you have more money in your bank account, you can buy more stuff. When you have more energy in your energetic bank account, you can do more stuff. So um, um, transcending the to-do list is a way to get more energy. Let me just read this private comment. Oh, you're so welcome, Lucy. Thank you for tuning in even for a moment. And I hope that you have a beautiful yoga class. And let me just roll back for a moment and read um, this other private comment. Ah, yeah. Well, okay, if, if you don't, if, so Melissa had something that can be a private comment, but doesn't have to be, I will speak to it. I think that it's actually worth talking about. Um, the question is about spontaneous orgasm, especially in sleep, especially if a person has been abstinent or partnerless for a certain amount of time, that I consider that to be actually like a very positive aspect of body health and energetic hygiene. It's kind of like if you are not in your daily waking consciousness or you know, partnerless or with a partner, um, abstaining and not having that experience, the body and the energy centers are still um, accreting a huge amount of energy. And at a certain point that energy is going to flow and it's going to, um, you know, like, like the dam will break or the, the, um, the snowpack will melt and the rivers are going to flow and these things are going to happen. So for both males and females, that is an experience that happens. And I consider it to be only a positive experience. Like it just is, it, it, the experience of orgasm literally means all systems are go. It literally means that your body is healthy and functional and your spiritual connection and your spiritual software and hardware are all fully functional. It is a positive thing. We live in this world right now where, again, like I'm speaking delicately, I don't want to speak too much to, um, you know, if any like young people are inappropriate or talk, because it's a private thing, things that aren't necessarily articulated. But uh, in our world, there are so many things that are shamed that it's not, so there's a big difference between something that you should never do and something that you should just do privately. Like you should never, you know, like whatever hurt butterflies or puppies or kittens. But some things you should do, but just do them privately, like the things that are done in a bathroom or the things that you do intimately with yourself or with partners. You should do them, but they're just to be done privately and not really to be spoken about that much. And I respect others' privacy and others respect mine. And this is also part of telepathic society. Like you don't put your tendril of attention into people's activities where it doesn't belong. Um, you know, like being, being like a peeping Tom ghost or something like that. Like I would never do that. Um, those of us who have attainment would never do that type of a thing. Um, so yeah, so it, it means that uh, actually, like I said, both your software and your hardware, your um, spiritual capacitation and your um, physicality body, hormones, neurology, and blood flow are all functional. And that's actually a very, very positive thing that um, should, should be like a uh, thumbs up and uh, positivity from the cosmos. Please never feel, I don't know if this is a message to you that you need to hear, it's not directed at you, but to anybody who is watching this, please never feel shameful or ashamed at um, spontaneous orgasm that might happen either in waking consciousness or at night. In, in the dream state, that these are aspects of your sacred divine experience and connection and are part of creative life force energy. Orgasm is creative life force energy. And when that energy flows up your spine, what literally happens as it comes from that reservoir that is at the base of your spine and it comes upward and out, it fertilizes your pineal gland. It's literally you're making love with the cosmic Christ presence that you are bringing into being existence with these 
raisings of energy or kundalini experiences so it's very very deep important good stuff that is in many ways um diminished uh either thrown out the window denied or actively shamed in a lot of the judeo-christian society that we're in but you know like i said throw all that out the window like don't don't walk um in a way that's inappropriate that will get you fired from work but please cultivate your sexy life force energy and please um cultivate your um creative life force energy um, in your body and in your body practices and do all of these things appropriately, like, you know, in private and don't endanger yourself in any way in the way that it is, you know, seen or perceived by others. But yes, please do the things that are um, what you're made for. We're, we're given these things as gifts and we're made for them. Um, so yes. And so now back to the organization of your physical world you want to organize your physical world. You want to clean your physical world. Um, all of that includes, like, like I said, your living space, your car, your workspace, and that can include like your office or your garden or your music studio or wherever you are. And I'm an artist, and sometimes my studio is crazy and all over the, all, you know, stuff is all over. And then I finish the painting, and they're like, okay, now it's time to clean everything up and organize things because the creative process can be messy. Um, hold on a second, let me just organize my thoughts for one moment because I'm. I'm going somewhere with all of this. Sorry, there's one more thing. It's going to come. Oh my goodness, don't worry. It will come. Because you can tell that it's important when something tries to distract me from being able to remember it and organize all of these things organizing your physical space. And then the very last thing that I want to talk about, water structuring, duh, as I'm drinking my water, trying to remember what I wanted to talk about. So my little anecdote, when I lived in a different location and I had kind of like, there was all sorts of stuff on my kitchen table, all sorts of stuff here and all sorts of stuff here. I didn't structure my water yet. This was like, you know, maybe like four or five years ago. And then I finally got, learned about water structuring and I finally got, um, the um, items and carafts to be able to do it. As soon as I started to structure my water, my whole entire life responded and I had to restructure my life. Structuring my water re helped to restructure my energy body and my cellular metabolism, but it also made me have to restructure my house because I had to make a space where I could put my water filter and my water carafe and my other, you know, items for, for doing this practice every day. And then once I did that, I cleared out this space, but then I was like, well, now this space over here looks so messy by comparison. I'm gonna have to get rid of all this junk mail. I'm gonna have to clean this up and put, put all the pens and pencils away. And then once I cleaned up that space and I was like, well, now I have to clean up this space over here because this space looks so messy and disorganized by comparison. And like, now I'm gonna have to clean up my music table in fact, this music table isn't even right. And I'm going to have to get a new table. And then basically little by little, everything in the radius around that area that I structure my water became restructured. So structuring your water is a really, really powerful level of energetic hygiene. What does it mean to structure your water? Water is a crystalline structure that is liquid. Although it is not like this type of a crystal, it has similar qualities to it in that it can be programmed or imbued with information. The information can be intellectual knowledge or emotional state of being. And you can program or mm, flavor, in, encourage, influence is a good word, influence the water that you are going to drink in order to be customized for you, for your health, for your vitality, and for your well-being. So I put prayers into my water. And the prayers that I put into my water have everything to do with prayers of gratitude, of being grateful to be in existence and have my body healing for or uplift or rejuvenation for particular body parts, learning something. When I first started to structure my water, you know what I found? As I poured it out of my carafe, into here, it didn't just go glug, glug, glug. It went glug, 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 glug. And I'd be like, that sounds like a song. I'm gonna go write a song. I literally had water, music in my water. 
And then that water I would drink and then I would feel so inspired to make my music. Um, so you can do a lot with structuring water. And then I did a whole presentation with Ines and um, she's from Iba, well Iba Wellness and is also a student of this class. And um, she has a wonderful device that helps in terms of structuring water where you can also put like a particular uh, a frequency basically information packet that might come from a particular plant like dandelion or a particular substance like vitamin C becomes programmed or imbued in the water, drink the water, which then gives your body that same information or frequency or positive influence, but you don't actually eat the dandelion greens. You don't actually drink the vitamin C. And uh, it's just an amazing way of being able to, again, um, fine tune and increase your body metabolism access to life force energy. So what is my practice like now? Like I have a little place in my bedroom. So that's actually a good place to structure your water because your bedroom should be like a quiet, peaceful sanctuary for you. And I have it in a spot that is away from the Wi-Fi router and everything like that. And it's surrounded by positive crystals. And I have my water filter there and I have my carafe there and I have my orgone energy, um, you know, li little uh, pocky pucks there. And I structure my, sorry, I filter my water. I remineralize it because the filtering process takes out a lot of minerals and minerals are also carriers of information. So I add additional minerals to it. When I am pouring it out from the filter into the carafe for its um, you know, overnight, uh, whatever, so it's its overnight kind of, ma not marinates, but it kind of like, um, whatever, I, I don't have the word for it, uh, is um, influenced by subtle energies overnight. That's why you don't want it to be near the Wi-Fi router. Cause it's like, I don't want it to be influenced by whatever is coming from there. I want it to be influenced by like a tree or, you know, like I said, an orgone hockey puck, or um, you can structure your water by putting on, on top of an image. Like I have literally an image that looks like my artwork and I put my carafe on top of there. You, so your water can be programmed by anything. So if you have um, a clear jug of water and you put it on top of a word that says love, Yes, the sensation or not sustenance of love should um, will go into that water. And anything that you put on the water jug, like um, you would want to imbue your water with things about um, love, health, positivity, nourishment, attainment, all of those things. It has a huge impact huge, 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 huge impact. And it is, again, a daily practice. So, you know, you brush your teeth every day and that's part of body hygiene. I structure my water every day. And then, you know, what if you're out at a restaurant and they bring you a glass of water? Like, it's not the same as structured water, but you can absolutely bless your water. And of course, bless your food too. And what is, or bless it or ask for a blessing on it. You can say it with your words if you're bold, because other people might give you side eye like, what religion are you? And what God are you praying to? And are you allowed to bless this water? And I might feel moderately uncomfortable being in your presence while you're blessing something. So just, that's fine. You can do it according to your comfort level. So sometimes I bless things with my words and sometimes I do it internally and ask for a blessing on the food and water that I'm about to ingest. It is definitely an intention, this energy. This is about energetic hygiene. So, you know, you brush your hair and you brush your teeth every day, no matter what level of maturity and attainment you are at, these are basics. And you can structure your water and bless your water and bless your food every day, that these are basics in terms of spiritual practice and spiritual attainment. And all of these things that I mentioned to you help us to accumulate and receive life force energy so that we are more joyful, more vital, have greater levels of health, and that that health and energy equates to or translates to greater levels of coherence in our light body and longevity. You literally end up being on the most positive, most nourishing timelines you can be on with your body. 
and these are profound activities. So in terms of structuring your water, you know, you can spend a lot of money, like there are many very fancy things that you can do. You can also just get these crystalline energy drops that are these silica drops that are amazing, that just change the surface tension of the water so that it hydrates your cells more effectively. If you don't know, your cells have a fatty cell membrane. It's made out of fats. It's positive. You like this. Um, and the um, stuff that's inside of your cells, your intracellular fluid is watery. It is aqueous. And so in order for water to get into your cells and help clean them out, it's got to get past the fat, but fats and waters don't mix. Oil and vinegar don't mix. So you have to find a way to break the surface tension of the water that you're drinking so that it actually gets in there to be able to more effectively hydrate the cells. So it really does help these little crystalline energy drops. They are made out of silica, which is a very naturally occurring, very quite ubiquitous um, mineral in our in our world and in our diet. So you can do water structuring pretty inexpensively. And the other, so the basics of it are, I add the silica drops to it. You must all, always filter and purify your water because there's a lot of crazy stuff that is in city water supplies. And even if you get stuff from uh, natural springs or whatever, please be aware of farm runoffs and things like that. These are from excessive nitrogen and stuff that is leached out from the water table, even if you get it from a, a pure spring, that sometimes there can be pollutants that are part of uh, just the environment at this point in agricultural byproducts, like um, I'm not even just going to name their names because they're, they're just like harmful black magic. Um, but there's tons and tons of different types of chemicals that are just in the soil. And most of them are um, byproducts of industrial processes or uh, agricultural processes. And you don't want them in your water. Luckily, there are plenty of good filters that you can do in order to do that. So you filter your water first, then you can soak your water in crystals. The crystals can include quartz. I use shungite. I sometimes use tourmaline. You can use aquamarine. I also put magnesium prills into my water in order to have more magnesium in my diet. You can put calcium in your water. Um, you can do these with droplets, like liquefied stuff. You can do these with slow dissolved tablets. You can also get things that are called cell salts, C-E-L-L -L salts that are, uh, it's a whole like, um, kind of like a, a set that you can get that are dependent upon your constitution, but you can also just get the generalized cell salt that's got every salt that you need for yourself and you know salt itself. So when you structure water, then what I do is I put it into these different either egg-shaped carafes or uh, they're ovoid or one of them is kind of shaped like music. It's very beautiful. And um, there are subtle energies that cause the water to move slightly overnight. So I put my water into fluid dynamics. Oh my goodness. So most of our water is coming to us through straight pipes and 90 degree angles. And water hates that. That's like me in that sleeping bag. I'm like, I can't sleep. Like I'm in a straight pipe. This is so uncomfortable. Water likes to flow and it likes to flow in circular and spiral motions. So when you get water out of the straight pipes, the water is not happy. Water in nature would be flowing over rocks and rivers and creeks and it never takes a straight path. It goes do, 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 do and it giggles along and it does all these cool things. What you wanna do is try to recreate that after the water comes out of your faucet or out of your tap by making it go through either a vortex, which again, there are these, there's the Mayu vortex, or I have a swirler. It makes a little swirl so that the um, energies of the water swirl together. Um, or you can just have the properly shaped container that you put it into. And the key thing is just let it be there for about 24 hours. You can cheat, you can do like 12 hours. So fill up my containers at night. They're ready for my coffee in the morning. The egg-shaped container creates these very interesting complex fluid dynamics throughout the container of the water that are based upon nature's intelligence, divine intelligence. Like they are flowing through everything that exists especially prevalent when we don't have electrical signals or Wi-Fi signals. So if we lived in a completely natural, pristine environment, everything that we would feel would be these beautiful, natural, undulative sine waves. 
but we don't feel that like there's 5G that is kind of like a Z-shaped wave and then all of these straight pipes and 90 degree angles. So we don't have that a lot in the way that our physical um, houses and architecture it, are um, created. Um, but of course, so um, Asia and China knows a lot more about this. They call it feng shui. They know like that's why their roofs have a little curl up at the edge or they structure things so that there are again, rounded corners and non straight lines. They recognize that these are um, not good energy hygiene to be around certain geometries. And you can also look to the work of Dan Winter, hat tip to Dan Winter, great thinker, great teacher, great speaker, not a total endorsement of the man and everything about him, but he does very good work in teaching people about how essential it is to structure your communities according to you know, these divine principles. Um, because the way that we have like these roads, 90 degree angles, like everything is done incredibly unconsciously. You are not cultivating your chi very effectively at all. So again, like, again, I, I rent an area of a home to live. I'm not a homeowner. If I were, I could make things curvilinear and circular and change them. So what you do, if you live in a place that you cannot change the basic architecture, it's essential to do things like you put up crystals, you put up mirrors, you put up things that help the flow of energy to flow in positive um conduits or um, patternings so that the energy is cultivated and not dispersed. And this is everything that I'm teaching and telling you guys about. So yes, um, Pedro has a question and Pedro, thank you for being here. Much love to you, long-term student. Says our bedroom should be our light bunker. Yes, I think so. I didn't even go into this enough. Um, thank you for asking that beautiful question. It opens the door for me to tell you so much more about energy hygiene based on light. I should have included this. There's a lot of light in our environment right now that is non-natural and not positive to your energy hygiene or to your spiritual attainment. Most of it is would be classified as blue light. Most of it comes from LEDs, like computer screens and stuff like that. So look, um, blue light or blue shifted light is mostly what we would be experiencing during the noonday sun, and it is highly stimulative. In order to get good rest at night, you do not want to have exposure to blue light, let's say from like 5 p.m. onward. Guess what kind of light your phone and your tablet and your computer emits? Guess what kind of light I'm staring at right now as I'm doing this Zoom presentation? blue light. So it's okay. Like it's 4 p.m. now. This isn't going to um, give me so much blue light stimulation that I feel like I can't sleep at night. But a lot of people have this habit. They're sitting in their beds at night, scrolling on their phone or scrolling on their tablet, literally beaming a color at their eyes that tells their brain and their neurology to stay awake because they think that it's the middle of the day. So it has everything to do with your biochemistry and the light sensitivity of your pineal gland and your neurology. Blue light inhibits the formation of melatonin, which is the go to sleep, be peaceful and regenerate your cells chemical that you want in your life, okay? Red light and infrared light is what encourages restfulness and encourages melatonin production. And that's what we get when we sun gaze at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. So what I have in my bedroom right now is I do not use the fluorescent overhead light at all. Again, I'm a renter and I would not have a fluorescent bulb in, in my house if I were like totally in control of the lighting situation nor LEDs either. So I have a separate floor lamp that has incandescent bulbs. I also have a nice little Himalayan rock salt lamp that um, lovely student friends sent to me that is such a treasure. And it makes a beautiful, warm, glowing light. And then I also have a nice little side lamp next to my bed that again is an incandescent bulb. So after, I, if I'm a good girl, 
and I finish up all of my stuff that I'm supposed to finish up, you know, by like 7 p.m., 8 p.m. here in my room, like finish my emails and stuff. Like sometimes I'm like a naughty girl because I have to get into bed and like, oh, I forgot to send that email or, oh, I forgot to send out my class notes. And then I'm sending emails from, from my bed, but I'll tell you what I do. Um, but if I'm a good girl, I finish up everything that's, um, you know, stimulative and blue light oriented and administrative here in my art studio. Then I get into bed and that is the process of like, you get, you change your clothes, you get into your comfy jammy jams, you curl up with your dog, turn on the incandescent bulbs so that that way I'm not stimulating myself with a lot of blue light. And then also I have my little infrared light panel that I will use at night before going to bed. What if I remember, oh, like I gotta send out that emails or also like, what if I wanna watch a video or something like that before going to bed. What I have done is on every single one of my devices, what you can do is you go to on Apple, you go to settings, then you go to display and brightness, then it will give you options. One of the options is night shift, click on night shift. First of all, you click on manually enable until tomorrow. And then there's less warm to more warm. I put everything to more warm. And I do that first thing in the morning so that on my phone, I am never staring at blue light. It's always this yellowish type of light. It doesn't matter unless you're trying to do some kind of a Photoshop where colors really matter. It doesn't matter. Things look yellowish. And same thing on my iPad. Color shift your electronics away from blue. It will help you a lot. And the other thing you can get, you can get glasses. They're not corrective lenses. They're simply polarized lenses that block out blue light and make it possible for you to not be so stimulated. It, it, it helps with being able to go to sleep. And it also really helps against the eye fry, like the Y fry fries your eyes, this blue light. I really think that there's something about eye fry. And um, there's also a lot of good work being done in recognizing the connection between blue light, retinal stimulation, and macular degeneration, which has increased strongly over like, let's say the past 10 years or so, as we've become more addicted to these devices that we stare at almost all the time, um, macular degeneration is when the retinas of the um, eyes stop being photosensitive, you know what regenerates them? Infrared light. So you must rest your eyes, spend some amount of time not being stimulated by blue light or artificial LED light, and spend some time you can get infrared through your eyelids. And that's an amazing thing. And that is what I do with my infrared light panel. My eyelids are closed hold it up in front of my face. And I usually do that first thing in the morning. Infrared helps to regenerate your retinas so that they are photosensitive and that you can still see and sense colors and um, sharpness, accuracy, the acuity of your eyes. And um, so you have to sleep at night. You have to spend your night. And also, so, okay, my bedroom, I have infrared and incandescent lights. And then when you go to bed, you should turn off all your lights. You should not sleep with lights on. You should turn off all your lights. Sometimes I keep the Himalayan rock, rock light on. But um, our body produces effective melatonin in the presence of darkness. And also your eyes regenerate in the presence of darkness. So you close your eyes and you sleep someplace dark. And then also, you know, you use the infrared panel to help to regenerate the retinas of your eyes. Um, but excessive exposure to blue light is the antithesis of good energetic hygiene. And when I recorded this 10 years ago, this was not as much of an issue. Like now, everything in my life, pretty much in all of our professional lives, involves doing video conferences, looking at the phone, looking at a screen, reading things off of the screen. It is part of life. Instead of saying, oh no, I'll jump out the window. What I want you to do is, you know, you get these blue blocker glasses you can get some for $10. It's not that much. I just, I hate the feeling of having to wear glasses. I haven't gotten them yet, but I should get some. Um, color shift all of your electronics, limit your exposure to not do them late at night, okay? That's it, it's just good energetic hygiene. And then the other aspect of good energetic hygiene I already told you about, 
sun gaze with the real sun. That is what I do first thing in the morning after I do my infrared light, when I wake up in the morning, after I make my dog go grrr because I'm waking her up too early, I do my infrared light panel and then I get up and the sun is rising in here and I sit or stand at my window and I do my ingestion with the sun and have beautiful explosions of energy with the sun and then I'm filled up with my energy for the day. And then at the end of my day, I take quiet, peaceful time whenever my schedule is within my control. And I talk to you sometimes because now our clocks have shifted, it's easier. But our sun used to go down at 4.30 PM. And then I'd be like, sorry guys, like I gotta go sun gaze. Um, but not to be rude, but it's just such a valuable thing to do. So I have a special chair that I sit in my other room in front of the sun as it's going down, perfectly filtered through a bunch of trees. And then I ingest that in my sun gazing practice. And at, you know, I often find like in the morning, I do it for like, you know, a couple of minutes, but the sun gazing going down at the end of the day might be like half an hour. I might really need that time to sit peacefully. Sometimes I put on music, sometimes I don't. And just have that light come inside of me. It is the red shifted light along with infrared light that is totally healing and nourishing to us. And I also feel like it is a way for me to speak to the sun and say, okay, sun, like here's what I experienced today. And here's, here's what I did with my directives from the morning. And here's how the day went. And the sun is like clipboard, like check mark, check mark, check mark. Okay, good, 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 good. And now go, go to sleep, rest up. And then in the morning, I'll give you your next assignment. Like, I feel like it's part of the whole rapport. Energetic hygiene has so much to do with the um, respect and um, making yourself available to the natural rhythms, natural rhythms of light and sunlight, natural rhythms of um, life force energy and chi, especially as it flows through water and the natural rhythms of moving from moment to moment in a state of frictionless bliss. Because when all of these things, because I don't want you to be like, oh no, 4.30, I have to go sun gaze. All these things should be about your life being frictionless and um, filled with ease, instead of easy, but filled with ease. Just like when you move and you move with ease, you're like, ah, oh, like that feels so good. And there are no impediments in your life, in your life, in the daily activities that you do, in your thought structures, in your desire to manifest, in your creative life force explosions through your body and in your ability to walk across your floor and have it not be cluttered by sweaters and coffee cups and midnight snacks and things like that. To move with ease through your life is what it is to um, practice good energetic hygiene. So that was a great question. So um, bedroom should be your light bunker, infrared and incandescent light only. And then when you go to sleep, sleep in darkness. And then hopefully like you have a window or something like that. And then um, the sun wakes you up when the sun starts to come up. But some people have to get up before the sun comes up. I know it all depends. And also I have, didn't mention this, but um, it's really best not to sleep with your cell phone next to your bed. Everybody uses the cell phone as the alarm clock wake up call. It's not really the best. If you have to do that, have it be not within your energy field, energetic hygiene. Oops, 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 oops. I don't want to scratch my, um, my, my sculpture over here. This thing senses your energy. I'm making that Kermit the Frog face. This thing senses your energy. It senses your energy when you touch the touch screen. It senses your energy when you keep it in your pocket. It senses your energy when you're looking at it and it's looking at you through the camera. It senses your heart rate. It senses your levels of excitability. It senses so much about us. That's just like the basics. And then there's esoteric stuff, like it's sensing you on other levels too. Um, it's in your energy field. If it's like, you know, within an arm's reach away, if you have to have it as an alarm clock, you know, any other options it can be in your bedroom, but like, don't have it directly next to your head. Don't have it, you know, whatever next to you have it like all the way over there on the dresser somewhere far away from you. And, um, then, then also it's good because then you have to get out of bed to actually turn it off when the alarm clock goes off, but also like get a, a cheap alarm clock that doesn't involve anything that has to do with a, a Wi-Fi signal um, in order to keep that next to your bed. And that, that that's ideal energetic hygiene. Um, Melissa says, plus a, a, an example. 
of city water running via pipes also picks up data and info of its surroundings and other people's feelings, thoughts, vibes while traveling the pipelines from street to buildings to your home. Absolutely. So we don't recognize enough of that about how much water is a crystal that takes on the imprint of that which it has experienced on its journey to us. So I should have also mentioned the clearing of energy from the water. I feel like that is done in the filtering process for me. But yeah, how do you clear something too? You clear it with your mind, clear it with your intention. You can clear it with a gesture. You can also clear something with sage. Um, you can clear something with a crystal. But yeah, it's essential. Just like when you get a, a new shirt, you got to wash it before you wear it. You got to wash something, whether it comes from the thrift store or whether it comes from a, a regular store. It's covered with stuff that you want to wash it off first before you wear it. That's also part of energetic hygiene. Um, I mean, like if we're really, really pristine here, because I have a friend, she's not on earth anymore, but she used to be able to read objects it is a particular type of like something mancy, um, you know, like psychic power. Um, we would go to thrift stores and she would like pick up an object. She'd like, ooh, like somebody stabbed somebody with this, put it, put it back down. You know, um, when you can pick up the energy that's on an object, you might not want to um, participate in thrift stores and secondhand objects. You might want to buy clothing that is new, especially clothing that touches um, private parts of your body. You, know, you might just not want to be having someone else's energy field interacting with your energy field through the unresolved experiences that are left as residues on their clothing beyond laundering. Like you can launder something, but you got to clear the energy off of the clothing or off of the kitchen knife or off of the whatever it is that you're getting. Because otherwise, every time you look at it, there's going to be an association. I look at this and it gives me the association of what this thing has done and what it has been through. That's what this is. Like if I look at a pile of unresolved laundry in my bedroom, then every time I look at it, I am ingesting the energy of unresolved laundry and it's a task and I'm hyper responsible and it tells me I have to do something. And there's no way for me to be happy and peaceful and restful when what that's what is beaming into my mind here. So either tasks that need to be done need to be in another room or I need to get them done. And then that's good energy hygiene because the basics of this whole entire presentation, I'm gonna wrap it up soon, boils down to you're marinating in your environment. And when you are, when your third eye is activated and you're energetically sensitive, you're feeling energy. And then I haven't even gotten to ener energy hygiene with other people, but basically um, you only want to interact with people that are similarly have positive energy hygiene because otherwise you're picking up on all of their stuff, ingesting it, and then carrying it with you. Um, so wait, 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 Melissa says, and that, so that relates to all the stuff that water has been through on its journey to you. It's been through a lot of angry and grumpy people and flowed through a lot of pipes of a lot of angry and grumpy people. And you don't really want that to be inside of you. Clear it. You want your water to be joyful. Water should be giggling over a stream. Water giggles and it bubbles and it's musical and lighthearted. That is what you want to be ingesting. And Melissa also says, I'm wondering if carbon nanotubes in the body via sprayed skies, we know what you're talking about, creates a sort of Faraday cage inside the body causing internal overexposure, more reasons to use infrared light. Yes. So I don't know if it creates a Faraday cage, but yes, yes, yes. The carbon nanotubules, the artificial fascia, artificial um, neurology that comes from the self-assembling wetware, um, what that is, is kind of like an energy limiter that creates the boundary that makes it difficult to connect with the outside world. And of course I fly in rimba lasagna and I energy past it, but then I also do so much to be able to clear out any kind of chemtrail crapola from me. And I did a whole detox group with people like a support group for people that want to know about how to do this. So yeah, my practices with infrared light have everything to do with clearing that stuff out on the daily, including the plasma wand, which I do a quick pass after the infrared, quick pass of the plasma wand all the way up and down my face uh, and body and then, and spine. I do a lot on my spine. And then I do that at night before I get into bed too. And I do that. And I also do all these things like the methylene blue, um, uh, chlorine dioxide, but not every day, methylene blue, but not every day, methylene blue, sometimes topically with vitamin C, um, CBD, 
um, topically, um, especially with the infrared, that's a really, really beautiful combo. Um, CBD when the sun is out uh, and the re regular sun, putting that wonderful cannabinoid on the outside of your body makes you an antenna that makes it easier to pick up on the higher dimensional frequency signals that come from the sun. It is amazing stuff. And it's, I mentioned CBD specifically, like THC is great. It's not legal in all states. It's not legal to ship it through all states, but there are plenty of CBD topicals that are totally legal in every state of United States. So there's no issues at me being able to encourage you to be able to access that medicine. And it's a wonderful um, uh, relaxation and uh, muscle, muscle healer too. Like if you have a tough day, do a soak in the tub with CBD and Epsom salts. Um, really feels quite amazing. So yes, so many reasons to use infrared light and the infrared light practices and plasma wand and CBD, all of these things are part of my Ener energetic hygiene and energy practices. And you know, it's another one. That's why I moved away from the city because there was so much um, frequency poop that I needed to stay. So you know what part of hygiene is? Not exposing yourself to a lot of poop crapola. And there was a lot of frequency poop in San Diego and really up and down the entire California coastline. There's a city, a small town, it's called Malibu. You guys might've heard of it. It's kind of between LA and where I live. It's one of the most wealthy, well-known enclaves. Lots of Hollywood stars have, you know, multi-million dollar mansions there. The energy there is poop. It feels terrible. You drive on this place that is next to a beautiful ocean view and there's the giant Gwen Towers are right next to it there. And the feeling of being there is not good energy hygiene at all. So please be aware of that, that there can be places that to your eyesight look like a beautiful vista or a beautiful mansion, but energetically, the energy hygiene might be very, very poor. And this is why everything from 10 years ago in my presentation really needed to be fine tuned for right now because we face a different time, a different context and you need to recognize that. And then um, the IBAMAC I think is really quite amazing that that is in terms of maintaining your energy hygiene, it is a crystalline um, hybrid type of device. So oh, like this is a crystal, the IBAMAC is a gallium arsenic um, crystal that's housed within a technological structure that connects to a technological device that I've been hearing the most wonderful positive feedback um, on people that I know that have accessed it and purchased one for themselves. It's just an amazing thing. Every time I hear about it, I'm like, that is even, it just encourages me even more. So full disclosure, I am an affiliate of IBAMAC and I wouldn't talk about it and stand behind it if I didn't think it was amazing. I would only endorse something if I really felt that it was a positive tool for human uplift, uh, protection and development energy hygiene, being able to use these different frequency healing tools. So that is one of them that I bring up here. Trisha's got a comment to me, but this is private for later. Oh, okay. Today's, so Trish, I will do that. I'm going to go FRL right away because I didn't get enough FRL done today. So yes. Oh, okay. And if you need some, well, then maybe we'll talk uh, after class or you can email me or something like that. I think maybe you called me. Um, but yes, so uh, quite opening the floor to questions, comments, or anything that you might wish to share. Other than that, it is just about time for me. Cheeky has had some exercise and she is in bed right now. Um, but I'm going to go do my FRL and my sun gazing, which these two things are like very, very much intimately connected. And um, Trish, I'm happy to um, call or text with you uh, if you have, uh, there you go. Okay, we'll connect right after class. That sounds good. Questions, comments, anything that um, anyone would like to share or needs clarification on, and I'm happy to do so. And I hope that this has been good um, guidance, encouragement, tools of the trade for you to be able to, Pedro says, love the lasagna, love received and love back to you as always. Thank you, really appreciate you being here. Appreciate everyone who's in the class because I know I don't always say people um, by name. I appreciate everybody who's here in this class, those who are able to tune in live and those who are able to catch the archive and even the, um, I call you the unofficial people, unofficial non-enrolled people who are still participants that find my work on YouTube. I thank you very much for being a part of this.
à Trish derrière with of course okay going to end the recording then if there's no questions i always give people a chance to type things out in the chat because sometimes it takes you a few minutes to type things out in the chat but uh if nothing comes up then i will say thank you very much thank you <laughs>